the topic i will be taking you through is temporomandibular joint ankylosis and at that uh, at the outset i thank the organizers for this herculean efforts they have undertaken to conduct this virtual master class 2020 now when we talk about joint ankylosis it is otherwise referred to as fused joint or a stiff joint temporomandibular joint ankylosis is also referred to as craniomandibular ankylosis in its true sense is characterized by formation of a bony mass which replaces the normal joint architecture the quality of life in such patients is greatly affected due to their deformed face and reduced jaw function affecting each mastication and deglutition when it comes to etiology of temporomandibular joint ankylosis it may be categorized into trauma infection inflammation systemic diseases and other miscellaneous factors the trauma uh, we may or we were blaming forceps delivery in the past which is not common today condylar fractures are a common occurrence infections include otitis media osteomyelitis actinomycosis periodic auricular abscess inflammation includes rheumatic arthritis ankylosing spondylitis psoriatic arthritis poliomyelitis and so on systemic diseases include osteoporosis pneumonia scarlet fever miscellaneous factors may have syndromes which may have concurrence of temporomandibular joint ankylosis uh, as one of the presenting when we browse through literature various hypotheses has been proposed Uh, for temporomandibular joint ankylosis uh, the first including parent strain theory which states that minimal strain or limited movement of the jaw will lead to endochondral ossification following trauma bone formation following trauma due to hemarthrosis is also documented ming et al proposed that forces similar to distraction osteogenesis due to lateral pterygoid muscle are responsible for causing temporomandibular joint ankylosis all the hypothesis directs towards genetic predisposition of temporomandibular joint ankylosis but tell at all have postulated that hypercoagulability of the blood at the traumatic site leads to temporomandibular joint ankylosis all the above mentioned theories do not completely explain the development of temporomandibular joint ankylosis with each one having its own flaws in completely elucidating the pathosis with the condition being multifactorial in its in the most logical and frequently encountered traumatic injury is traumatic injury to the pediatric condyle which is observed by most of the surgeons across the world now what happens is the fracture of a pediatric condyle are more prone for development of ankylosis owing to the peculiar anatomy of the condyle having a broad neck and highly vascularized head that has rich osteogenic potential when compared to the adult condyle it is hypothesized that hemarthrosis along with the disruption of the fibrocartilage integrity allows the ingrowth of fibrous connective tissue into the joint which results in ossification now this is a very famous depiction in row and williams maxillofacial injuries that in a child age 2 to 5 there is thin cortex and the periosteum is in active osteogenic phase following trauma there is intracapsular hemarthrosis and there is a comminuted fracture of the well vascular vascularized bone with multiple fragments which may lead or progress to temporomandibular joint ankylosis when we look at these two Uh, computed tomographic scans of the trauma to the condyle comparing adult with the pediatric population you would observe that in a adult uh, patient you will have fractures of the neck of the condyle to prevent transmission of forces to this skull base and preventing injury to this skull base whereas in the pediatric condyle you do the anatomy of the condyle you will have shattered fracture or referred to as mushroom like fracture of the condyle in a hemarthrotic environment which may lead to temporomandibular joint ankylosis touching the classification for temporomandibular joint ankylosis we may classify it as based on the sides involved unilateral and bilateral 
based on the location as intra and extra articular, based on the type of tissue involved as bony, fibrous and fibrosseous, and based on the extent of fusion, uh, dividing it into complete and incomplete. The most cited is shown is classification based on the radiographic findings, dividing temporomandibular joint ankylosis into four types, type one to type four, where type one is fibrous adhesions around the joint, with type four being more extensive as complete osseous block between the ramus and the skull base, altering the normal anatomy. Going through the clinical features of ankylosis, let us divide into unilateral and bilateral. Uh, touching on to the unilateral clinical features of temporomandibular joint ankylosis, when there is fusion of the joint, there would be obvious reduced or no opening. There would be obvious facial asymmetry present in the patient. When there is early onset ankylosis, the extent of facial asymmetry would be more than in adult ankylosis. You would observe fullness on the affected side and flattening on the unaffected side. The ankylo side would have fullness considering the soft tissue does not or occupy the space of the undergrown mandible. Whereas the opposite side being elongated considering the normal growth of that side. There would be obvious occlusal canting evident in early ankylosis because the maxilla on the ankylo side is logged and the growth of the maxilla is also affected. Whereas the opposite side maxilla droops down where there is normal growth with the obvious deviation of the mandible to the affected side. There would be shortening of the ramus on the ankylo side. You would observe a prominent antigonial notch on the ankylo side. Elongation of coronoid may be present unilaterally or early in such cases. Angst class 2 malocclusion would be present on the affected side. Now, when we jump on to the clinical features of bilateral temporomandibular joint ankylosis, you would again like unilateral ankylosis would have reduced or nil mouth opening. You will have a very obvious retrognathia or microgenia, the bird face deformity, which is classical to these patients as seen in the first picture on this slide. The occlusal canting would be absent as the maxillary growth is logged on both the sides of the ankylosis. Short ramus is present bilaterally. You would have prominent antigonial notch on both the sides. Class 2 angles mal malocclusion may be present bilaterally. The upper incisors are protrusive usually with apparent anterior open mind. Proclination of the lower anterior teeth is evident to compensate for the uh, deficient growth in the basal bone. You would observe elongated coronoids bilaterally. Another associated problem with temporomandibular joint ankylosis is obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. Now what happens is when you have microgenia or micrognathia, the tongue musculature and the suprahyoid musculature falls back in the pharyngeal space, resulting in obstruction of the air. This is another issue which needs to be addressed in temporomandibular joint ankylosis patients. Going on to the management of temporomandibular joint ankylosis, anesthesia is the cornerstone for managing such patients. Fiber optic scope assisted intubation is the norm currently and is followed across the world. Another problem which we recently published is when you have early onset ankylosis, in unilateral cases, you would observe the shift of the hyoid complex and the entire laryngeal inlet is shifted towards the ankylose side, which may further add to the difficulty in intubation and administration of general anesthesia in these cases. When it comes to surgery for ankylosis, it may require staged procedures. The sequence may vary, but one is the main aspect, which is release of the ankylotic mass or release of ankylosis. And second is an orthognathic surgery procedure or distraction to restore facial form and aesthetics, along with addressing the obstructive sleep apnea, especially in pediatric ankylosis patients with secondary deformity.
surgical uh, anatomy in this region is very vital as you have vital structures like facial nerve in and around this place uh, key factors being we should limit our incision uh, to less than 0.8 cm in the preauricular region and should not extend the incision in the preauricular region below the attachment of pinna to the face the medial aspect we should take care of the vasculature namely the ma maxillary artery which should be uh, taken care of there are n number of surgical incisions which are documented in literature directly going on to alcat bramley which is most talked about and practiced or its modifications which are practiced widely this is a reverse question mark shaped cosmetically acceptable incision which gives excellent access to the temporomandibular joint without causing any damage to important anatomical structures starts superiorly through the scalp in the temporal region and extends inferiorly to the tragus now any of the preauricular incisions we should note the fat plane which is present between the split of the temporal fascia after the preauricular incision the fascia is identified and a 45 degree angulated incision from the root of the zygomatic arch is placed to expose the fat plane after the fat plane is explained exposed the dissection should proceed below the fascia and in between the fascia and the fat plane as in these patients or usually the uh, facial nerve lies over the temporal fascia after you have incised the uh, fascia at the fat plane region so thus protecting the facial nerve from injury this should be noted now when it comes to surgical procedures to release ankylosis three noted procedures are condylectomy gap arthroplasty and interpositional arthroplasty condylectomy is the procedure which is undertaken usually when the joint anatomy is not deformed like in cases of fibrous ankylosis the possible problems with condylectomy include loss of vertical height bilateral condylectomies may result in anterior open bite gap arthroplasty is a procedure which involves creation of an anatomical gap in the ankylo segment to form an artificial joint space two horizontal cuts are made in the most superior aspect of the ramus creating 1 to 1.5 cm interpositional arthroplasty is arthroplasty followed by placing an interpositional material between the cut ends of the bone this minimizes the chances of re ankylosis the interpositional materials may include biological materials like dermis fascia fat or cartilage and alloplastic material including vitellium silastic or alloplastic another procedure which is documented in literature is esmax procedure where a wedge shaped bone in cases of ankylosis is released at the angle region to attain the mouth opening now lateral arthroplasty is another documented procedure especially in cases of chronic type 2 ankylosis the lateral aspect of the ankylotic mass is released alone with retention of the medial mass another mod few other modifications which are documented in literature includes dr paul c selins procedure which is sub ankylotic osteotomy the osteotomy is created below the ankylotic mass andrade's modification here the posterior aspect of the gap arthroplasty is slanted to attain adequate mouth opening coming on to caban's protocol for temporomandibular joint ankylosis this includes a certain steps to attain adequate mouth opening for these patients to start with aggressive resection of the ankylotic segment ipsilateral coronoidectomy if the mouth opening is still less than 35 mm contralateral coronoidectomy followed by lining of the temporomandibular joint with temporalis fascia or cartilage after which imf is done and the reconstruction of ramus condyle unit is done using costocondyle grafting rigid fixation is done for the graft and early mobilization and aggressive physiotherapy is undertaken caban modified its protocol in 2009 with the difference of 
incorporation of distraction osteogenesis as the modality for reconstruction of ramus condyle unit. Rest of the factors remain the same as the previous Caban protocol. Now, there are various techniques which are in practice for reconstruction of ramus condyle unit. These include costrocondyl grafting, which is usually taken in growing pediatric patient. You may utilize the cut coronoid graft for reconstruction of the ramus condyle unit. Vertical ramus osteotomy may be undertaken. Inverted L ramus osteotomy may be undertaken. Ramal distraction is another option for reconstruction of ramus condyle unit. And last but not the least, total alloplastic temporomandibular joint replacements are also a possibility to reconstruct ramus condyle unit reconstruction. Now, another associated problem with temporomandibular joint ankylosis is facial deformity secondary to temporomandibular joint ankylosis. Now, to correct these facial deformities, you have in the armamentarium maxillomandibular orthognathic surgeries, orthomorphic osteotomy, orthomorphic distractions, unilateral, bilateral, or multifocal distraction osteogenesis. Simultaneous orthognathic surgeries along with total joint replacements. So these may be undertaken to correct facial deformity. Facial deformity is more pronounced in the patients who uh, have temporomandibular joint ankylosis at an early age and grow with this problem as compared to the adult population or adult patients. Who uh, have ankylosis. Now, these are the reference. Uh, the wonderful reference is our own uh, AMSI book, Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery for the Clinicians, which has the entire chapter, which is very well written uh, in uh, the book for the postgraduates. Next, uh, you should go through surgical approaches to the facial skeleton by at least to uh, understand the preauricular surgical anatomy and also the options. To uh, explore or surgically expose the preauricular region. Any questions may be uh, directed to my email ID or the phone number, whichever is convenient. Thank you. Thank you very much for the patient listening. I think uh, thank uh, our uh, association, Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons of India, to undertake this wonderful task for our postgraduates. Definitely it will benefit them. Thank you. Thanks a lot for patient listening.